With the US election just around the corner, traders and investors are keen to understand exactly who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers from this event. Now, of course, there not every event plays out exactly the same as the last, but we do have historical comparisons to be able to draw from to understand what would be beneficial for markets, what could potentially drive markets down, what could benefit the US dollar, what could weaken the dollar, and what kind of sectors we could potentially see people favor, depending on the different policies undertaken by each of the candidates. So within this video, I will try and take you through all of that primarily gearing you up for what we should expect from equity markets and the US dollar, depending on the different outcomes for this election. So here we go. Here's a breakdown for the current voting. Uh, this is a poll of polls from 538. It does point towards Harris being in the lead. But quite frankly, you know, it's a poll of polls and you do see different things from different polls. It appears to be that it's a relatively close run battle. That wasn't necessarily uh, the case when it came to Joe Biden. And so the fact that we have this uh narrowing in terms of uh, the two candidates does point towards a higher possibility that we see a split Congress. And that's going to be really key as we move through some of these slides, because the split Congress could be the, the thing that really changes the public opinion and the market's opinion on exactly whether this is beneficial or detrimental to equity markets. Here's a breakdown in terms of some of the different factors that uh, I have sort of taken um, from the different policies that you've seen um, speculated upon from different candidates. Some of them are a little bit wishy-washy. I mean, look, we're, as I record this video, just over a month away, let's say five, six weeks away from the event, and you're still seeing things start to come out. You're still seeing some of the policies that previously had been uh, announced. Uh, they're starting to row back on it a little bit. So it almost feels like this sort of tit for tat. If one person takes the lead on on yeah, the business side of things and the other candidate might suddenly step in and, and say, look, I'm pro business as well. And so it's likely to change over time. But let me just breeze you through some of this. Donald Trump favors low corporation tax. Of course, that's going to be beneficial for profits for U.S. businesses um, with the move down to 15 percent, whereas Harris is talking about a higher corporation tax. This idea that they're going to be able to gain significant funding uh, for their spending through higher corporation tax and taxing these big uh, big tech names in particular. That is a cornerstone of her policy. So if we were to see this uh, a victory for, for Harris, and in particular, if she takes both sides of Congress, so you're talking about the Senate and the House of Representatives, then you're talking about a much higher chance that this that corporation tax increase happens. And that, of course, has implications in terms of valuations for some of the stocks in the US in particular. Personal taxes, you know, you've got Donald Trump talking about an extension of 2017 tax cuts. Uh, whereas Harris, again, trying to raise some funds from the high earners, you're talking about those earning over 400k uh, would be paying higher taxes, whereas there would be an expansion of the income tax credits for lower income workers. The big key thing here really for markets is this idea that we see taxes on unrealized gains. That is absolutely massive. Of course, typically what is the case is you you know, when you sell out of a position, that's when you've realized your profit or your loss. And therefore, if you earn a certain amount, then you would have to pay a tax on that. Well, Harris is talking about taxes on unrealized gains, which means that you may not have actually benefited from that position financially. You may not have sold out of that position uh, in the equity markets, but you'd still have to pay for that profit uh, that you have sitting uh, on the books. So that's going to be really key. I mean, it's it's something that many have said will not happen. And certainly if we were to see a split Congress, it's, it's highly likely that uh, that wouldn't happen. Um, but certainly if we were to see a Democrat victory across both sides of the Congress, the possibility of taxes on unrealized gains could be detrimental to sentiment within markets, uh, certainly unless and until we see Harris essentially take that off the table, because it's a it's a pretty, pretty ballsy move, quite frankly. Healthcare, we're talking about with Trump, it's increased transparency, promote choice and competition for drug treatment. It's nothing too radical, quite frankly. It means that 
he, he's not going to do much whereas harris is talking about lowering prescription prices talking about the reduction of price gouging from sellers so there's going to be certain businesses that are essentially making money off the back of selling prescription drugs for sky high prices so some of these healthcare names could potentially see their profits uh dampened or or cut back on from the idea that, that we're going to see some measures taken by harris now whether that comes to fruition or not remains to be seen it's not the first time that we've seen these kind of things uh, mentioned over in the us and, and, and it does raise the question of whether you would see the same kind of r d for these healthcare and pharma firms if they don't get uh, this massive payout at the end of it, what's the point in spending all this money in, in all of this uh, uh, research to try and find the drugs if you don't get the, the full financial benefit at the end of it? Um, so certainly healthcare stocks likely to uh, be a little bit cautious if we were to see a, a sweep from Harris. Jobs, we're talking about deregulations and tax cuts for uh, things on the Trump side of things. So he generally favors jobs within sort of manufacturing and sort of traditional industries energy um over on the harris side she's talking about an increase in minimum wages to 15 dollars uh, per hour stronger work workplace workplace protection so this is really talking about benefiting workers uh, but can be deemed for companies that are reliant on sort of low wage uh, employees this could be deemed as an increase in costs and potentially get passed on in the form of inflation. Defense, this is a key one because Donald Trump has pretty much said that he's going to end the Ukraine-Russia war within 24 hours. And pulling back on the funding of the um, military would certainly come to the detriment of Ukraine. Europe would likely try to fill those shoes, but they're significant shoes to fill. And it would certainly increase the likeliness that Ukraine were to essentially have to give up part of its uh, land and certainly if you're looking at the position of Donald Trump saying he would end it within 24 hours well it's not a war within the US and Russia right it's a war within between Ukraine and Russia so it's up to Ukraine whether they want to end it and if Ukraine still have funding and bear in mind that the Democrats have already front-loaded a huge amount of funding for Ukraine in preparation for Donald Trump potentially winning if they've got the funding, they're likely to continue it. So it's not going to end within 24 hours, but it could mark the beginning of the end to it. So certainly some of those defense stocks would uh, feel the hit on the idea that they potentially don't necessarily see the same kind of demand going forward. In terms of Harris, it's likely that they will continue to fund Ukraine because that's exactly what her uh, current plight is with Joe Biden. Inflation. Well, this is going to be a massive one because Donald Trump is talking about tariffs on imports uh, for, in particular, Chinese goods, in particular EVs, but essentially saying he's going to tax everything that comes into the country from abroad. He wants everyone to create their products in the US. That is, as Harris's side have been claiming, a tax on the US consumer. You can't impose tariffs on goods from around the world and pre presume that the prices aren't going to go up. A potential resurgence in terms of inflation would be massively detrimental to equity markets because equity markets right now are in a great position. Why is that? Because we have a soft landing underway and we have interest rates being cut. What would undermine that? Well, a resurgence in terms of inflation, because that would essentially stop the uh, cutting of interest rates or certainly point towards a potential stopping of, of that uh, monetary easing. So on one side, a resurgence in inflation. The other side is a resurgence in terms of things like unemployment. Now, you would see that point towards a recession. So if we saw a recession in the US, you know, markets could be hit. But at the same time, you'll get, that's going to be dampened somewhat by the likely ramping up of interest rate cuts in the absence of inflation. So inflation really is the key one. If we see a big surge in inflation, we're in trouble, quite frankly. And at the moment, that isn't the case. People feel quite confident we're not seeing a resurgence. But if you see tariffs imposed on all of these goods coming from abroad, then the US could be in for a second wave of inflation. And that certainly could come to the detriment of stocks. In terms of Harris, she's pledging to drive down food and housing costs. Some of that she'll be able to do, some of that she won't, quite frankly. Um, and you would probably argue that she's kind of semi in power with Biden at the moment. And, you know, it's not that they've been able to drive down the cost of food and housing to, to any 
great degree and you know why would it change if she was to take the the hot seat um in terms of trade you know i've mentioned this before 10 to 20 percent tariff on foreign imports even china for even higher for china um whereas you're talking about on the harris side of things more targeted tariffs uh, but generally she's more about free trade and free trade you know is generally the situation that the world should strive for it's not one country against the other each country specializes in what they do best and by specializing they can bring down the costs and therefore the world trades and everyone's better off for it this idea that it's one country against the other uh can be a fool's errand and ultimately what does it lead to it leads to higher prices at a time where we really really do not want to see a resurgence in, in terms of inflation i just want to show you just quickly here this slide that we've got in relation to that if we were to see a ramping up in terms of those tariffs, if Trump comes in for a second term and he manages to pass these and ramp these uh, tariffs up, who's going to be a big loser? Germany would be the big loser in Europe. Um, so it's the major manufacturing, exporting uh, countries that are going to be hit, certainly. And then, of course, China. And it really would come at a time when China is trying to get itself back on its own two feet. We're seeing these stimulus measures coming in. So the idea that China is suddenly going to have to pay huge tariffs on their exports to the US, they already do pay significant tariffs. Um, but it just further clogs up the global trade system. Uh, it comes to the detriment of China. It comes to the detriment of, say, Australia and New Zealand that export a lot to China for them to be able to create things. So really, it puts a dampener on global growth expectations. And then finally, fiscal policy. It seems to have been clipped a little bit at the bottom here. But we're talking about Trump, who's talking about less spending. We're talking about Harris, who's talking about a more ex expansionary fiscal approach. And that takes us on to this, right? The public debt in the US has skyrocketed over COVID. I mean, this is something that's happened across the world where countries have essentially had to prop up their economies in the absence of any business, right? When we saw these lockdowns, a lot of these countries just shut down and kept paying people to do nothing, right? And that's what we saw the huge surge in terms of debt. And that's what's been detrimental in terms of uh, what's happened recently with the rise in terms of uh, interest rates, because if you ramp up interest rates at a time where there's huge debt, then each time it rolls over, you're having to renew that debt at a high, ever higher uh, value. So you're going to have to pay more and more interest. The debt payments uh, that the US are currently having to make are crippling. And if we stay in this position and we continue to see that debt pile rising, and in particular, if we see interest rates remain high, then this is just going to balloon beyond belief. Well, interest rates are starting to be cut. So that is a positive. And some have said, well, this is, you know, we, we can't wait to 2% inflation because we've seen this massive pile of debt building up. We need to see the rate of borrowing being cut. Um, but the other side of it is, you know, which one of these candidates will try to drive down uh, borrowing? Which one will try to balance the books? I mean, the book's not going to get balanced anytime soon, but certainly the idea that they're going to cut back on the debt rather than pile more onto it does provide the basis for people to look at the US dollar and say, you know, what's the sustainability of this in the US or look at uh, valuations in terms of equity markets and say, well, the US doesn't look that stable if you look at the, the debt position that they're in. So debt is certainly a key factor. This is a breakdown that I've managed to find that essentially tries to sort of weigh up the different policies that the two have come out with. It's by no means going to be absolutely perfect, but it does point towards a net decline in the def deficit uh, for Harris's policies, most notably because of the tax hikes that you don't see from Donald Trump. Whereas Donald Trump, by the looks of it, will add onto that debt pile. The question mark really is whether markets really care about that. The US dollar could weaken off the back of the, this increase in the debt, but they're quite used to it, right? I mean, this is the direction of travel, so it wouldn't necessarily be a step change to see it go up any further. So this is a breakdown in terms of some of the different sectors that to work, look out for that we might see impacted. And the actual impact that we see is often different from the perception. But certainly when we're talking about volatility around this event, you're talking about the potential for these events, for these uh, measures to come in rather than re the reality of it. Bear in mind that we're always looking at it from the perception of, do we see a split 
or joined Congress. If we see Republicans take both sides of Congress, then they can get through what they want. And the same kind of thing with the Democrats. The flip side is, you know, you can see Donald Trump win, but he doesn't take both sides of Congress. And therefore, some of his uh, more hardline measures do not get the support that he wants. And therefore, you know, some of the more significant measures don't actually happen. There's a little bit of a continuation of what we've been talking about in the in the previous slides. But certainly, you know, breezing through these, you can see energy. We're talking about drill, baby, drill. Now, Donald Trump has always been perceived as a pro-energy, pro-oil and gas candidate. And certainly when he was in charge previously, he ramped up production. He, you know, supported oil and gas companies. However, whilst you're looking here at Harris and saying, well, she's, you know, talking about higher investment in green energy, we've seen record production under Biden, right? And the key thing for uh, the Dems has been they wanted to drive down inflation. And so the idea that they're going to suddenly at a time when we're seeing Saudi Arabia potentially ramping up production to regain market share, the idea that Harris is suddenly going to pull back and try to drive down uh, production in terms of oil. You know, I don't think it's necessarily going to happen if she thinks it's going to be inflationary by driving up the price of oil. So in actual fact, the the pro oil candidacy of Donald Trump has to a large extent been mitigated by just looking at what has happened with Joe Biden and Harris uh, having been in charge over recent years. Defense, of course, defense stocks are going to be key here when we're talking about the potential future for the Ukraine Russia crisis. You know, obviously, it's not the case that we're saying, oh, we want this crisis to, you know, this war to go on forever more because defense companies and arms manufacturers do well out of it. But it's a fact that when there are wars, those companies do well. So if we were to see a, a, an end to that conflict, there's a possibility that we start to see those companies start to weaken in terms of their share prices, demand starts to decline. Manufacturing firms are going to be key, but a lot of it comes down to where they are located. If they've located their operations within the US, then they may benefit uh, because they have increased price uh, competitiveness if Donald Trump taxes all of the imports from elsewhere in the world. However, you're also talking about some companies that are currently set up to produce in cheaper locations around the world and it could come to the detriment of them. So it's really going to come down to a company by company basis. Harris unlikely to impose harsh tariffs given the impact on inflation, but she has said that she'll step in to try and uh, curb unfair practices when it comes to China. So there is a possibility of some tariffs on some Chinese goods, but much less likely to impose as, as harsh measures as Donald Trump uh, is pledging. Same kind of thing with car makers, but really car makers uh, is going to be a, a, a separate entity, really. Perhaps this is why Elon Musk is suddenly Donald Trump's best mate, because essentially we've got huge competition from China uh, in terms of EVs. They're produced at very high quality and very cheap. And Tesla, if you look at their sales in China, they're feeling it, right? There's massive price competition in terms of EVs. And what is happening in China is likely to happen in the US. It's likely to happen in Europe. So if we don't see major tariffs being placed on these goods, it's likely that the likes of Tesla could really suffer as a result. And you've seen uh, Donald Trump coming out saying they'll impose huge EV tariffs. Biden proposed a ban on Chinese EV software recently, which essentially would uh, counteract the idea that the Chinese are going to move into the country. It could actually be a smart move because one of the moves that the, the Chinese EV manufacturers are talking about is to essentially relocate some of their production to places like Mexico. Now, of course, they've got their North America free trade agreement with the US. So a good coming from Mexico uh, is very different from a good coming from China, even though they're being produced by a Chinese company and the profits are going back to China. The ability to ban the software within the car means that unless they strike a deal with the US software manufacturer, the cars won't be able to come in to the country, irrespective of whether they're made in Mexico or in China. So quite whether that comes to fruition uh, remains to be seen. But certainly the, the treatment of EVs uh, around the world will be really key, in particular to US car manufacturers, most notably Tesla. Equity markets have always been perceived to be positive under Donald Trump. If you cast your mind back to when he was in uh, power previously, 
he pretty much told you every time we saw a record high in uh, the S&P 500. Whereas the likes of Harris, well, she's talking about taxes on unrealized gains. So that could undermine demand. You could see people forced into selling where they need to try and raise money to pay for these taxes on the, the profits that they haven't actually realized yet. So you do have the potential perception that she's supposedly anti-markets. Um, but of course, there's so much that goes into all of this. You know, you could say, OK, Harris is talking about a tax on unrealized gains. Therefore, a win for, for her could be a negative for equity markets. But then at the same time, people could say, yes, but we're talking about these massive tariffs on anything coming from abroad for uh, under Donald Trump. And therefore, we could have a surge in terms of inflation and monetary policy is impacted as a result. So there's certainly positives and negatives to be drawn from each of these candidates. Finally, we've got these last two housing. You're talking about nothing major from Trump. You're talking about new homeowners get a $25,000 deposit assistance for Harris. That could be positive for home builders in, in the country and pledging 3 million new housing units and infrastructure pro uh, projects generally geared towards sort of traditional infrastructure projects when it comes to Trump, whereas Harris is talking more about green infrastructure. We've already looked at that. So let's get into this. First and foremost, when we've seen previous occasions of the election, we've seen a significant pickup in volatility as we head into the event. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that when we see events like this, say an election or we see um, you know, a Brexit vote or something like that, these major, major market events, you'll generally see brokers across the board uh, trying to mitigate against the volatility that we do see. As you can see here, we generally see a massive pickup in terms of volatility. So you can expect things like potentially higher margins and higher spreads uh, across some of the assets. Um, and that is just something that's pretty typical for some of these sort of high volatility events across the board. And you can see that's exactly what has happened in the past in terms of volatility building up as we get into that November election. In terms of the outlook for the economy, this I thought was pretty interesting. This is the composite PMI under different leaders, the blue line, of course, Dems, the red, Reds, Republicans. And what we can see is that there's no guarantee that one party is pro-business and one party is anti-business. You know, for, for one uh, election cycle, you could see, you know, uh, a president that takes the, the country out of recession into positive growth and it ends up back in recession and the next takes it out of recession then we see it in gro growing throughout that a lot of this just comes down to what's happening in terms of uh, the markets as a whole at the time and the, the economic outlook at the time here are some charts that show you so this is the historical annual growth rate under different leaders again this really reiterates that it's not necessarily one party that is guaranteed to benefit markets right republicans have done well republican have republicans have done poorly you know democrats have done well and well we don't have a a, a period where the democrats have suffered but a lot of it can come down to whether we see an economic crisis during that period that might not necessarily be down to that leader in particular. Here's a breakdown in terms of the year on year uh, movements. And sometimes, you know, you'll see someone's tenure really dragged lower by one year in particular. Um, but certainly you do tend to see significant volatility over uh, that period. This is, again, a, a similar way of showing it, but also showing the different drawdowns that you see. So you're likely to see significant volatility and it isn't necessarily just a case of saying that one party is better than the other. Remember, I've highlighted a whole host of different policies that these uh, different candidates are undertaking. And there's arguments on both sides as to whether one is better for business or one is better for markets than the other. So this probably makes sense for me to show you in full screen right so let's just look at some previous examples leading up into the election the ele the yellow line shows you where the election has taken place and what we've typically seen is selling pressure leading into the election these are the last four elections we've seen the S&P 500 declining ahead of each of these so notably November can be a tough time for markets this is the 
pre-election period shown in a different way. So what we have seen is when we see the incumbent, so essentially the person that's in the White House now, when we see them win, generally we see relative stability. Now, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen at the election, but the polls will point towards it. You have seen uh, for the the periods where we see significant declines, those have all happened at times where we've seen a switch at the White House. And generally that makes sense because we have increased uncertainty. Here is a breakdown for some of the previous elections to show you what happens generally between the election and between the inauguration. And you can see on essentially all of these uh, events apart from Obama, which was, you know, 2008 crisis, all of them have seen markets rising. So generally you see volatility, uncertainty, wariness in the lead up to the election. But once the election result has come out, you see outperformance for equity markets. Here's the S&P 500 over the three months following the election. Again, strength if you see the incumbent winning. So the status quo is seen as a positive. Is We don't see the uncertainty uh, that comes with a new leader at the White House. And, you know, that's not to say that a, a new leader could be is going to be a negative, uh, but you're more likely to see volatility as people are concerned. Now, it's worth noting that an incumbent win on this occasion wouldn't be an incumbent win like previous years because it wouldn't be Biden taking on a second term. It would be a change under Harris. And so you can see that as a little bit of sort of an asterisk or a caveat to that chart in particular. S&P 500 after the presidential election, if you're splitting it out according to who wins and what Congress looks like, we can see that the most beneficial outcomes are a Republican where they take both sides of the Congress, so a full sweep, or a Democrat where it's a split House, uh, sorry, with a split Congress. So they maybe take the Senate and they lose the House. Right? What we don't want to see, and we've seen it in the past when we're looking at some of these policies, what we don't necessarily want to see in terms of equity markets is the idea that one side takes the full Congress, because generally that brings more hardline measures. And on, on the Republican side, it could raise fears about ramping up of tariffs and the potential for resurgence in inflation. Whereas on the Harris side, we're talking about uh, taxes on unrealized losses and alike. So for equity markets, for my money, I think it's likely that we will see uh, the greatest benefit if we see a split Congress. And finally, let's wrap it up by looking at the US dollar. Generally, we see in the two months before the election, a weaker US dollar uh, when the incumbent's winning or when the incumbent ends up winning. So the status quo provides a weaker dollar, i.e. we don't see that haven role coming into play. Whereas when we see a higher likeliness of the uh, of a change at the White House, that's when you likely see strength in terms of the US dollar. And then looking beyond the event itself, you typically see the first two weeks where if we see a change at the White House, we see volatility in terms of markets and we see strength in terms of the US dollar. That can often fade, um, but generally if the incumbent wins and we see the same party or the same candidate stay in the White House, we see straight after the election, we see the US dollar weaken. If we see a change at the White House, increased fear about what could be coming next, that may not last too long. Typically it lasts about two weeks, up to a month. But certainly that change, that uncertainty is the kind of thing that provides the basis for uh, a US dollar resurgence coming into play after the election. I hope this has been useful. Certainly this historical context and putting this together has provided me with a lot of information to be able to go into this. So hopefully it provides you with the same kind of useful insight into who could be the winners and who can be the losers from this upcoming 2024 US election.